Our, our next speaker before our break is Leo Roseman. Uh, Leo is going to talk about uh, psilocybin-assisted therapy, neural changes, and the relationship between the acute peak experience and clinical outcomes. Leo, Leo Roseman holds a BS uh, Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience from Tel Aviv University. Uh, since June of 2013, he's been a PhD student in, the neuroscience, in neuroscience in the Beckley Imperial Research Program um, under the supervision of Professor David Nutt and Dr. Robin Carhart Harris. Leo specializes in fMRI analysis techniques, and his main research focus is the neural correlates of psychedelic visual imagery and psilocybin assisted therapy for treatment resisted depression. So I will call Leo to the stage. Leo, you're on. Thank you very much. Maybe, Help me welcome him, please. Well, maybe wait two minutes when people go out and. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody again just to keep the voices down uh, as we go to our next speaker. Thank you. Hi. So my name is Lior. I'm a researcher at Imperial College London in the group of Dr. Robin Carateris and uh, Professor David Nutt. It's a big privilege to be here. I'm going to talk today about psilocybin-assisted therapy for depression, a recent uh, depression trial, and the relationship between the peak experience and the uh, clinical outcomes. And I'm going to talk about changes in emotional processing and the neural correlates of that in the amygdala. So first of all, I'll start with a bit of uh, bureaucracy and money, because a lot of people like to ask this question. Uh, it took a long time to get the approvals, the ethics approval. So from the moment we got the grant in 2012 until we started the study, it took almost three years to get the drugs, to get the ethics, to get all the regulations. And the, the price of each dose of psilocybin was 1,500 pounds. So it was quite an expensive study, and much more expensive than a street dose. Uh, so psilocybin is the active compound of magic mushrooms, and we use this to treat uh, treatment-resistant depression. We had 20 patients in our study. All of them were treatment-resistant, which means that they tried at least two different uh, therapies, in the, therapies in the past, usually antidepressants, and it failed for them, and then they came to our trial. Now, we gave them two doses of psilocybin. The first dose was of 10 milligrams, was a low medium dose, it was more like a preparation dose, and the second dose was a 25 milligrams dose a week after, which is a strong psychedelic experience. Um, now, also important that what happened before the session, so the preparation, and the preparation, the trust between the patient and the therapist is builded, uh, but I think even more importantly is the trust between the patient and himself. So the patient is going to go to quite a deep uh, experience and sometimes it's going to be fearful for him and he needs to trust his kind of new, new psychedelic self that he's going to discover in order to let go into this experience. During the session the patients are listening to music with eye shades and two therapists by their side supporting their experience. After the session also important is the integration process uh, which means that the, it's an attempt to take all these insights from the psychedelic experience, which can be quite strong and profound, and kind of change it into and manifest it uh, to everyday living, to changes in behavior, to changes in relationships, to changes in cognitive patterns. So how we take all these insights and we make them more applicable for everyday living. So I'm going to just start with the clinical results. And uh, we can see here 19 patients completed the study. And these are the score, depression scores of all 19 patients in different time points. And we can see the baseline, the depression scores are around 20. And there is a strong drop in depression after one week. Very, very beautiful result, very strong result. And then we see, at, so the black are the averages of the, of the group at different time points. And we see that up to five weeks, there's a very strong uh, decrease in depression scores and that goes up a bit at three months and six months time points. So still even in three months and six, time, and six months time points, the result is very strong, especially for this difficult population of treatment-resistant depression. Uh, but I believe we have places to improve, like maybe giving another dose for a few of the patients to continue some process, or maybe just improve the structure or uh, kind of 
different aspects of the structure and the variables of the therapy that might need to be improved, like preparation, integration, like the music. Uh, and this is something that we're still learning. So uh, the question is, what's the brain mechanism, or sorry, what's the mechanism of uh, this clinical outcome? How come one dose, one experience, or few or two doses in our case can lead to such a profound change? And there are two main ways to look at that. The first one is the pharmacological approach, and the second one is the psychological approach. There are other approaches, but these are the two main ones. Now, the pharmacological mechanism uh, is something that I believe is still quite speculative. Uh, it might have some truth in it, but we don't really know yet what's the pharmacological mechanism that leads to the long-term changes. Uh, we can speculate that uh, psilocybin or 5-HT2A receptor agonists, they act on the serotonergic system, and uh, therefore they modulate the serotonergic system and lead to improve in depression because depression relates to the serotonergic system. Another way we can look at it is that uh, we know from the acute state that there are changes in functional connectivity, changes in connectivity between different areas in the brain. The brain, in a way, becomes more entropic or more flexible, and that might allow uh, long-term changes in depression, which is a kind of a rigid uh, condition. But less speculative, in my opinion, is to look at the mediation through the experience. And that might be obvious to many people here in the crowd, but it's actually not very obvious to a non-psychedelic crowd, mainly the psychopharmacological crowd that kind of used to work with drugs in a, with one line of explanation. So what we suggest here that 5-HT2A receptor agonists create this kind of flexibility in the brain that in the right set and setting allow a certain experience to happen and that acute experience is what uh, leads to the long-term changes. So both, both, both explanations are uh, valid and both, probably both of them are true to some extent, but I think the one that's mediated through experience is more established. And now we need to go a bit back into in time and history and to see w in kind of what exactly we do and put it in the historical context. So at the 50s, there used to be a lot of psycholytic therapy using LSD uh, to treat different conditions, but it was low to medium doses in a talk therapy, as an add-on to the talk therapy. And then at the end of the 50s, L. Hubbard, Hoffer, and Osman in Canada uh, kind of changed the way LSD was used into psychedelic therapy, which means a very high dose, 500 micrograms in their case, uh, to treat alcoholism with the intention to create a transcendental experience, which will be transformative. And that was the beginning of psychedelic therapy. And then many followed, and actually we, in a way, followed their approach. And people who follow them uh, using the same technique was also Stan Groff and Bill Richards and Walter Pankey. And Pankey and Richards, uh, they defined the mystical or peak experience uh, as uh, with few dimensions. So the dimensions are experience of unity or the loss of sense of self, transcendence of time and space, deeply felt positive mood, sense of awe, meaningfulness of psychological or philosophical insight, so every insight feels quite important, ineffability, which means it's hard to describe in words, and paradoxicality, which means that oppositions seem to merge. Uh, Richards and Pankey used both the term mystical and peak interchangeably. interchangeably. Peak comes from theories of uh, Maslow, and we would prefer in this talk to use the term peak, but actually it's pretty much the same. Uh, so Maslow, at the same time, was investigating the peak experience regardless of psychedelics. And Maslow is the father, one of the fathers of humanistic psychology and positive psychology, the study of uh, positive experiences. And he was suggesting that uh, peak experience can, can, can occur spontaneously. And he was investigating peak people that have a lot of peak experiences. So this can happen in a strong creative moment, in a strong therapeutical uh, insight, uh, or with a deep meditation or different other different ways to go into this kind of altered state of consciousness state. Uh, so Maslow was not studying LSD, but he just studied the peak experience. And he was also suggesting that peak experience leads to self-actualization. And he defined people who are self-actualized as more spontaneous, more autonomous, creative, expressive, playful, but he was also suggesting that they're not very much egocentric or self-obsessed. They're also more compassionate, more accepting themselves and others, more grateful. Okay, so that's the theory that Maslow uh, 
uh, was working on and in some way psychedelic therapy kind of fits that humanistic approach or also an existential approach. So different studies in the 60s and 70s were showing that, that the peak experience measures of the peak experience relate to the clinical outcome and peak experience leads to self-actualization. Uh, so again, Walter Pankey, Stan Groff, Bill Richards, uh, people at Spring Grove. Uh, and then the 1977 is the last study from the old days of the psychedelic, of psychedelic therapy uh, of Bill Richards. And then we continue to the kind of renaissance today of psychedelic therapy, and we see in Johns Hopkins and Bill Richards is still there, uh, a continuation of this tradition showing that the mystical experience leads to uh, kind of this the, is important for the personal meaning of the experience, that the mystical experience creates changes in openness, uh, that the mystical experience is a predictor of a positive, positive outcome in the treatment of tobacco addiction, and that the mystical experience recently in the uh, Johns Hopkins and NYU study uh, predicts the reduced anxiety in clinical outcomes in the study of end-of-life anxiety. So we ask the same question for our study in our treatment-resistant depression population, whether the peak experience relates to the clinical outcome. Instead of just looking at the peak experience, we uh, chose to look at, at a lot of dimensions of the psychedelic experience using the altered state of consciousness questionnaire and kind of predicting that aspect of the peak experience would be predictors of the outcome, while different things like the visual experience, the imagery, would not predict the clinical outcome. So this is what we actually see. So we split our group at five weeks into the ones who are responders and non-responders. Responders are the ones that had more than 50% reduction in depression, and non-responders are the ones that had less than 50% percent uh, reduction in depression. And this is five weeks after the psilocybin session. Now we go back, we split these into two subgroups, and we're going to look at what's the difference between their experience at, uh, under psilocybin. So we see that the responders had a stronger experience of unity, a stronger spiritual experience, stronger blissful state, and insightfulness. Other aspects of the experience, the more perceptual ones, as disembodiment, complex imagery, elementary imagery, uh, audiovisual synesthesia, changed meaning of perception, all of these did not relate to the clinical outcome. And what we can also see from this is that anxiety was counter-therapeutic. Okay, so none of our patients had a worsening of the symptom, but it just means that less anxiety during the session had a better clinical outcome. Okay? Uh, so that kind of fits the idea that anxiety sometimes blocks the kind of real uh, therapeutical process and in many cases people who are resisting the experience, they feel anxiety and anxiety can prevent the therapeutical process. Uh, we want to look at specific items and how these items predict the clinical outcome. So we look at the altered state of consciousness questionnaire and we order it by the, by the, the strength of the prediction. So the items at the top are the ones that mostly correlate with the five weeks clinical outcome, and the items at the bottom are negatively correlated. I uh, hope you can see that. I will read some of them. At the top, we see, I felt particularly profound. I had particularly inventive ideas. I experienced a profound inner peace. Worries and fears of everyday life felt irrelevant. I felt one with my surrounding. I experienced past, present, and future as unity. Oppositions and contradiction, contradictions seem to resolve. So we see these items that relate to the peak experience. And at the bottom, the ones that negatively correlated with the clinical outcome are time passed slowly in a painful way. I felt threatened. I had the feeling of unbearable emptiness. And I cannot really read from that. Um, so, these so we can see here clearly that items, the kind of positive psychedelic items, relate to a positive clinical outcome, and the more challenging ones relate to a less positive clinical outcome. Now, we're not saying that the challenging ones are not important, and sometimes they are an important part of the healing process, but we just think that maybe this questionnaire uh, is not really accurate accurate in uh, measuring the resolution of these experiences. So a person that had anxiety during the whole session or a one that had strong anxiety at the beginning would give pretty much the same rating. And we cannot really separate the resolution of the struggle of the kind of challenging experience uh, with this questionnaire. Therefore, we need to develop a better 
tools to measure also the resolution of the challenging experience. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, brain changes after the therapy. So we recorded uh, MRI, fMRI before the therapy and after the therapy. And specifically, we looked in an area in, in the brain, a network in the brain that's called the default mode network. Uh, my supervisor, Robin Carter Harris, been investigating this network quite a lot. And we know a few things about it from the acute psychedelic experience. So with healthy volunteers under acute influence of LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca, uh, we see decreased integration of the default mode network. So what does, in, what does integration mean? Uh, the default mode network have different nodes, okay? And these nodes are co-activated, they're working together. And decreased integration means that they're working less together, these nodes. Now the default mode network is a network that's related to the sense of self, and we see in our studies, and also a study of ayahuasca in Brazil, in the group of uh, Draulio and Fernanda, uh, showing uh, that this decreased default mode integration relates to uh, ego dissolution, so to the losing of sense of self. Now the question is what's happening a day after the therapy? Uh, whether this continues on or there's something different. And so this these are studies in healthy volunteers. Now we're gonna move back to our uh, depression trial. So we looked at fMRI before and after. Now the changes that we see one day after the therapy is actually increased connectivity between different nodes of the DMN. So this is actually the opposite to what we see in the acute state. And this change also relates to the clinical outcome. Okay, so it's quite surprising, so it's still, we still need to replicate it uh, because it's, in a way it's a bit of a surprising result, but if we look at the humanistic kind of framework of the peak experience, some, some, this result in a way makes sense. Okay, so we do, we do know that in the acute state there's disintegration of the default mode network, and then in the post-psilocybin state there is kind of increased integration. Now if you look at the theory of Maslow, peak experience is the experience of losing the sense of self, the unitive experience, but this leads to self-actualization, to a fuller self, to a stronger self. This relates also theories of flow or different Eastern philosophies that the losing of sense of self momentarily uh, kind of uh, may, might allow kind of a stronger self when it's kind of puts back, put back together. And therefore we think we see this decreased default mode integration and then that leads to an increased integration. So one limitation of this, uh, what we're say saying about the peak experience, and I think this is a very important and big limitation, is that uh, we're not measuring really other potential mediators. So we believe that there are other things in the therapy that are important. Uh, this, these might be the personal kind of experience, a catharsis. Many of our patients have a good kind of deep cry within the session. Uh, the connection between the therapist and uh, and uh, patient, uh, regression into childhood experiences, relieving of trauma, all of these are possible mediators that we actually don't quantify. The only one we quantify is the peak experience. So this is the only one that we actually can say it's a good, it's a mediator. But we need to have better tools in order to look at other mediators. If you're, um, one of, one of these mediators might be the emotional openness to music as Mendel showed in the talk before me. So the strength of the openness to emotional openness to the music during the acute psilocybin state predicts the clinical outcome also five weeks after the therapy. If you're interested in other mediators, you can check uh, Alex Belser talk uh, in Amsterdam last year at ICPR. Uh, it's from NYU, qualitative study, and it's actually have some interesting uh, possible mediators in this talk. So I would like to kind of conclude this part, this uh, first part of the talk, uh, saying that it's important to look also at the efficacy of the experience. Uh, drug studies always kind of uh, talk about the efficacy of the drug, how effective is the drug. But with psychedelic studies, we should change a bit this narrative in order to talk about the efficacy of the experience. How effective is the peak experience? How effective is the emotional catharsis? Different parts of the psychedelic experience that are facilitated in the therapy session. Uh, when we do that, we can also ask questions of what's the biological correlate of this type of experience and how this biological correlate uh, might change the brain. So instead of like 
talking about a neurogenesis or neuroplasticity of the psychedelic experience or the psychedelic drug, we should talk about uh, the neuroplasticity of some part of the experience. So let's say the peak experience creates neuroplasticity and not just LSD or psilocybin in general. And that's a way to look at, at kind of uh, the, the how clinical outcomes and changes in the brain and psychological changes are mediated. So the second part of the talk is going to be about emotional processing and changes in the amygdala. Amygdala is an area in the brain that relates to emotional processing. It used to be known uh, uh, to process uh, mainly fear, but these days we know that it is processing fears fear and other emotions, actually so the whole spectrum of emotions. It's not processing only negative ones. And we wanted to look at changes in the amygdala because it's been uh, studied quite extensively uh, with antidepressants, with SSRIs. So if you put a patient with depression in the MRI scanner and you show them fearful faces, uh, negative emotions, you see that their amygdala is hyperactive. Now, SSRIs reliably reduce the amygdala reactivity. So we see here a meta-analysis of many studies of SSRIs, of antidepressants, and antidepressants reliably reduce the amygdala reactivity to negative emotions. We don't really know what it's doing for positive emotions, whether it's increasing the activity or decreasing it, but we know that it's decreasing for negative emotions. So we used a similar paradigm, and we measured fMRI at baseline and one day after the therapy, and uh, we measured fearful faces, happy faces, and neutral faces. And we wanted to see what's happening in the amygdala. Now, the result is quite uh, interesting. It's quite provocative. Uh, provocative is fun. And we see increases in the amygdala uh, one day after the therapy. So increases to fearful faces, to happy faces, and to neutral faces, but more specifically to fearful compared to neutral faces. I would just like to say that this is only one day after the therapy. We don't know if this is also valid for one week and one month. This is the afterglow period. It's still very much related to the kind of the, the therapy session itself, the psilocybin session itself. Uh, so they, we see increases in the amygdala, which are the opposite of what we know about SSRIs that decrease amygdala reactivity. Now the question is, does this relate to the clinical outcome? And the answer is yes. We see uh, that if we split our group to non-depressed and depressed, and we can also split the group based on a threshold, and we can also, sp also split into responders and non-responders, and we look at this fearful compared to neutral, we see that the increase in the amygdala is stronger for the non-depressed uh, subgroup. Okay, so this is interesting, and now the question is why? Why do we see decreases with SSRIs uh, and, uh, we, uh, for negative emotions and increases uh, with psilocybin-assisted therapy? Uh, we don't really know what SSRIs are doing to happy faces, but in our study we see also increase in the amygdala to happy uh, faces. So I would like to suggest here that this relates to the strategy of the therapy and the different strategy of the therapy. And SSRIs are a chronic administration. The strategy is relieving of neg relief, relief of negative symptoms. And uh, many people who actually use SSRIs, they kind of say, not all, for some of them it, really, it works really fine, but for some of them they say that it creates a general emotional blunting. So and that means that it's kind of easing the negative emotions, but it's also uh, kind of reducing the positive emotions. So it just creates a general emotional kind of decreased sensitivity, which allows the person to cope with his life. Uh, but what we believe that we're doing with psilocybin-assisted therapy is that we're actually confronting and working through uh, are through these emotions and creating emotional openness with the music, with the psilocybin, with the therapist, and therefore we see increased amygdala reactivity a day after the therapy because there's some increased emotional openness. Okay, so this is the uh, main difference we believe is related to these results. Now I'm going to give um, other examples from our study that relates to this emotional openness and increased uh, connection to emotions. So, uh, Roz Watts, that runs our clinical trials in Imperial College London, she's going to give a talk about this on Sunday. And she found these three core themes in all of our, in our patients in uh, interviews six months after the, after the trial. And she found that uh, 
most of the patients moved uh, and said that they moved from avoidance to acceptance of their emotions, from disconnection to reconnection of them to themselves, to their environment, to their culture. Uh, and most of them said that previous treatments reinforced avoidance, so that uh, all of them are treatment-resistant depression, so they're quite critical uh, towards SSRIs, but they said that SSRIs uh, created for them avoidance of emotions. This is a quote of one of our patients, uh, kind of also on this same point. I also see my dad abusing me again, something that has flashed into my head now again and again ever since it happened. But, once again, rather than pushing the image to one side and avoiding the situation, I look him in the eyes and move through the discomfort and fear, in and through, in and through. With my demons fully revealed and presented to me, having looked my deepest fears directly in the eye, I enter a state where I feel completely elated, at peace, absolutely euphoric, the most relaxed and content I've ever been. So again, this is a quote that relates to this increased emotional openness and sensitivity and kind of dealing with confronting uh, the, 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 the parts uh, in the self that kind of needs to be healed. So this is the last slide and it's more a, a personal story uh, that I was presenting this talk a few days ago uh, to some friends and friends and friend of friends and in the end, uh, a woman that works for a drug company, uh, she came to me and she asked me, uh, she said she was a bit confused from the, my talk. In one side, it was very scientific. I talked about fMRI. On the other side, I was talking about the mystical experience. And that was quite confusing for her. Uh, and she said, if you want to get approval of the FDA, you have to play the game. You have to do science. Uh, and I believe she confused the game with science. So the game means that how you take psychedelic therapy and put it in the framework of psychiatry. And in order to do that, you have to deform it a bit because it doesn't really fit uh, inside this kind of framework of thought. Uh, the danger of just playing the game is that uh, in the end, people will follow a deformed psychedelic therapy approach. Uh, science is seeking truth. It's the study of the truth. And in that case, if it doesn't fit the framework, the framework uh, needs to change. Now, I'm not saying that the game is not important. It's also important uh, to, to play it, but also sometimes you need to do science. And if science leads you to talk about mystical experience or peak experience, uh, so, so be it. And that's how it should be. Uh, <laughs> now, this is obvious for us, but it's not obvious for a lot of people uh, out there. Uh, we do a, have a psychedelic survey uh, if you plan to take psychedelic anytime soon in a retreat, in a party, in nature, at home. Uh, just log in, put your details, answer some questions uh, before and after your experience. Uh, I would like to take, thank Dr. Robin Carat Harris and Professor David Nutt for, uh, for supervising me, for Mendel Kalin, Roz Watts, Dr. David Arizzo, Amanda Fielding and the Beckley Foundation for Financial and intellectual support and the MRC for financial support. Thank you.